Can you guys hear me? One, two, three. Okay. Hello, hello everyone. Thank you so much for for joining us. I know it's a uh, it's a little special time right after the the launch. So hopefully we're not going to be too boring for you. Uh, if, if someone's going to snooze, we're just going to ignore it over there. So or just throw something at us, and then we know we're not doing that good. <laughs> So my name is uh, Chris Janiszewski. I'm a solutions architect for, for Red Hat. Uh, I specialize with OpenStack and, and technologies around OpenStack. And hi, my name is Darren Sorrentino. I'm also a solutions architect at Red Hat. Um, I, do special, I specialize in doing proof of concepts, deep dive technical discussions with customers, uh, and helping them achieve their uh, long-term goals in deploying OpenStack. And my name is Aaron Hinkle, and I'm a systems architect at Sprint doing R&D work and helping the transformation from purpose-built hardware into an OpenStack virtual environment. All right, so, so uh, today we want to focus on, on uh, three major areas. Uh, one of the area, we, we want to tell you a story of, of success or how to be successful in deploying OpenStack in Telco. So let me start with the, with the question, how many folks at the audience here are coming from Telco? Oh, that's great. You're in the right spot, so don't leave yet. <laughs> um, so, so we're going to focus on, on three areas. Why uh, telcos are moving to the cloud. And then we're going we're gonna to give you a little presentation on how are they doing it, how are they implementing the cloud. And, and since the, the telcos are mostly focused on, on networking, we're going we're gonna to spend a big time of this presentation you know, talking about different options and architectural evaluation for it. And I'm going to hand it over to Aaron. So in the telco environment, what we're facing with is an inverted business model. So the traffic volume is going up exponentially. Pretty much every telco in the world is seeing this with the advent of 4G and soon to be 5G. The users, once they have the bandwidth, they're using it, and they're gobbling it up as fast as we can provide it. But unfortunately, most users are liking the unlimited for a flat fee cost structure, which means your revenue is flat. So the problem there is, is that with that inverted business model of no new revenues, but an increasing demand from the user, you have an upside down business. And what we're trying to do is bring that network cost, plateau it and slightly decline it so that we pro um, the profitability of a telco can increase instead of just being a basic electric company kind of scenario. But telcos have another problem. I was in a presentation earlier today about the Etsy, NFV, and how long it takes to do standards. Everything getting out to the market in telco is long. So particularly at Sprint, we have a problem where to get from inception to actual product and customer hands takes about two years with everything that goes on. And what we've realized is that for services where all the profits are at, we're getting eaten alive by the Googles and the Apples and the Facebooks of the world that can get time to market much, much quicker. So our goal was to get that two years to get from concept to reality and get that down to less than a quarter. But we have a separate problem. At least in the US, there's a lot of land. There's a lot of territory that we have to cover. And what we start seeing, especially when IoT is out there, is that we need to cover places that we didn't traditionally cover. The farmer's field doesn't have a lot of people there, and there's not a big desire to pull fiber and put towers out there. But when you start looking at IoT and you start looking at where things are at, we have to start thinking of moving out of the regional data centers and moving further into the markets. And depending upon the business case, especially with certain IoT use cases, you need to get further into the markets, out into the neighborhoods, depending upon the market and where you're at. But that's not the only thing. Telcos have a 911 service. They have to get emergency calls. If grandma picks up the phone and she's trying to dial uh, and get an ambulance there, that call has got to go through and it's got to stay up. So being in a cloud environment, it, we don't care if a virtual machine went down, if a node went down, a data center went down. That 911 call has got to stay up. So these are kind of the business drivers of what's going forward. We've got to distribute it, we've got to get our speed, and we've got to get the cost down. So when we, uh, when we got accepted to, to speak in front of you, we, we were thinking really hard what type of content would be, would be valuable to, to present. And, and one of the thoughts we had, like maybe not, like we, we're coming from the, from the Red Hat, from, from the OpenStack vendor. We have a lot of experience deploying OpenStack. Probably between me and there, we have hundreds of OpenStack deployment under our belt. 
But we, we thought maybe this is not what these guys are gonna look for. Like, th these guys are an expert, but they don't know telco very well. Uh, so what we decided to do is reach out. We're, we're very fortunate from the Red Hat perspective. We're very fortunate to work with most of the telcos out there in, in North America and, and, and beyond. Um, so we, we decided to reach out to what we thought were the, the key decision makers uh, at these different uh, telcos in, in North America and, and survey them with, with, some, with some questions on, on how they're deploying OpenStack. Uh, so, so the goal for us was, again, to guess the, get the best practices um, and, and kind of try to find out what are the challenges, what works and what doesn't work. And um, so one of the questions we ask is uh, why telcos are moving to cloud, right? And there's no surprise here. The number one reason is to solve the, the NFV use case, right? Uh, either it's a voice over LTE or EPC or... Um, or, or some other network-related uh, functionality. So that was not surprised uh, to hear that. But also, it's interesting we learned, uh, since the telco's already investing so much skills and resources into the learning the OpenStack, open source, they're also looking for some opportunities to grow it beyond the NFV use case, right? So it's not unusual for our customers to also utilize OpenStack for the traditional IT uh, I don't know, the DevOps or shopping cart experience, et cetera, right? Um, also, there's a whole concept of the cap and grow where you, where you cap your legacy infrastructure and you just put your new workloads on this, on this new type of uh, infrastructure. And as uh, Aaron mentioned, IoT is, uh, is pretty big there too, right? So, so OpenStack, not just for the NFV, uh, that's what we learned from our customers. Okay, so why OpenStack? Why do they pick OpenStack? Um, so fast moving, the, there's a lot of features that are emerging that are uh, related for, for speci specifically for the NFV use cases, things like DPDK, uh, SRIOV, et cetera. Um, so telcos are looking for something that's fast moving that will be able to bring all these features and all that functionality to the table. Um, for, for ages, telcos were locked in into some proprietary solution to solve these problems. So they're, now they're looking to, to use the open source and not get, and not get this vendor lock in. Um, also, they want to use the industry, industry standard. And the one on the right is really something, I, I promise this is not something I put there myself. It was actually the, something we got from the, from the survey, so I'm very proud of it. Uh, so since telcos are using this open source, open source software, they want to make sure they get enterprise support. And, and Red Hat can provide not only because we have the best support, but we also have the best partners, right? So we, we work really hard with all the hardware vendors, network vendors, and storage vendors to really bring this, this uh, one, one big picture. But it all comes down to the cost, right? That's, that's one of the, really the main reasons. And all of these different things, they just, they just uh, happen to, to bring down the total cost of ownership as well. All right, so which infrastructure? We, we ask, uh, do you guys repurpose the infrastructure or you bring in new one? And I actually have a, have a cool story. So when I started working for Red Hat, my first telco engagement in POC was actually with Sprint, with, with Aaron. And, um, and he, he doesn't know that, but he, he's gonna have a uh, laugh. So over the the multiple years I've been with Red Hat, I have only one failed POC, and that's the one with, with Sprint. And uh, the, the reason we, we kind of couldn't plus off the, all the success criteria, et cetera, is we were trying to repurpose some of the old hardware, and we struggled quite a bit to make it, to make it work for us. Um, so, so in general, the, the answer is, if you, if you build this new shiny infrastructure, just, just make sure you bring the new hardware that's capable of doing things like hyper-converged and you know, new networking, SRIOV, et cetera. Uh, th don't try to um, you reuse the old hardware that no one cares about, and it's maybe more um, specialized to the virtual, you know, traditional virtualization. All right, so we asked about the networking, right? Do you use uh, OVS or do you rather uh, need some special functionality or enhanced functionality and, and um, you use SDN? 
And in general, we got most, most of the telcos we work with, they, they say they usually start with just, a, with just a regular OVS for the, you know, the main reason is cost, right, and, and being open source. And you can still achieve a lot of functionality for the, for the NFV use case just with the, with the open V switch. But with the same time, a lot of them express their interest as SDN and they were evaluating it at the time I, I asked the question. All right, the next question we asked is, uh, how big is your OpenStack, right? We, we were curious if there's a, a rather small amount of monolithic OpenStack clouds, like large deployments, or, or rather small, medium size. And the answer we got from, from them, it's usually small to medium, and a bunch of them distributed across the, uh, the area they do business with. Um, and it's mix of lab and, and production. All right, so, so another question we ask is, what are some of the hurdles? What, what, what were the biggest problems in, in deploying OpenStack? And, and still, I think the number one we got probably from every single one or almost every single one is the, the skill gap or, or ability, inability to find uh, folks within the organization that are able to, um, to, to work with the cloud with this new paradigm. Um, so, so I have a story about this, this uh, middle bullet. Clouds are very different for, to traditional telcos and, and siloed groups. So not so long ago, I, I, I learned first, firsthand how it is to, you know, to, to, be, uh, uh, to, to work in, in the silo kind of environment at telco. I was doing a, a workshop with one of the uh, North American telcos and they were trying to solve the problem of delivering OpenStack uh, in a shopping cart experience, right? So it was, not, uh, it was not the NFV use case, if you will. It was more like, hey, let's just use the same technology and uh, give it to the DevOps so they can develop apps for, for, the, for internal and external use. And I was, I was speaking with this uh, owner of this project and and he was, uh, he, in his mind, he already put together the whole architecture, and he was trying to mix, you know, the OpenStack with the really legacy, you know, infrastructure and, and, and uh, virtualization and, and some technologies that doesn't work very well with OpenStack, or it's not, they, they don't, they're not uh, designed to work together very well. And we're, we're trying to help him out. We're trying to tell him, hey, um, you know, th there's just the little changes we can do here and there, and make it work really good and be, and, and be great. But he, his mind was set on, uh, no, my people already know these technologies, these legacy storages, whatnot, and we're not changing anything. Uh, so then my argument to him was, uh, hey, this is gonna, we can, we can hack it, right? We can make it work for you. We can hack it together. But anything, anytime you hack something, you create a snowflake, and snowflakes are really hard to manage and operate, and, and the guy answers was, I don't care, I'm not operation, right? <laughs> so, so that's where I hit me, right? Uh, these guys, maybe they don't know how to work together sometimes, right? So, so something to keep in mind, right? Um, and yeah, get it, getting a consistent deployment and process, so, so again, it's, these are all connected. Don't try to get, don't get into the snowflake area, right? And um, how, do you, uh, how do you overcome some of these hurdles? Find the champions within, within your organization. So by champions, I typically uh, mean you know, folks with the, with the open source skills. Get them excited about this technology, and then they're gonna do the rest. They're gonna train the other guys. And if you don't have folks with the open source skills, you know, just, just hire some. Um, so lessons learned, we're asking them, what's the lessons learned from the deploying OpenStack, right? And I think the number one is the, is the most important piece of it. Automation is king, right? So you don't wanna get into the situation where you have to deploy all these different pods of OpenStack and, and do it manually. So, so think of it of, on automation from, from this way. But also it's, it's the other angle, uh, deploying the VNFs itself and pushing maybe day zero and day one configuration to them, right? So you definitely wanna, you wanna think of automating from the day one. If you're new to the OpenStack, 
make sure you, you know, you, you still have to get through the process manually, but then make sure to, to automate everything, everything you do. And there, you know, there's multiple tools to do that. Um, typically when I work with telcos, I work with the networking people. And when I, when I ask them why they're, you know, networking people, they usually, or the, one of the answers I got uh, from one of the customers is, I just don't like the code. I'm not a programmer, I don't, I don't like to code, so I just, I just became the networking guy, right? Because you don't have to code there, really. So, so one of the tools that we see a lot of uh, telcos and the networking people adapt is the Ansible. Uh, and Ansible is, the, the advantage of Ansible over some of the other uh, automation engines is you don't have to be a programmer to automate whatever you want with Ansible. You can, in my mind, you can become an expert in, in half a day. I'm probably exaggerating, but uh, it's really simple to use. Um, and then there's some, there's some other lessons learned. Evaluate OVS DPDK and SRIOV. I'm sure you guys went to a lot of sessions uh, here explaining the differences, et cetera. So I'm not gonna go into too, too much details. I think Darren is gonna cover some of that. Um, uh, focus on why and, and the use cases, right? Uh, VNF vendors are still learning, vet them well. Uh, that was one of the answers. It, it's funny, I worked, last year I worked for one of the VNF, one of the primary VNF vendor in, in US, and they were trying to solve some problem based on the configuration that the telco, that their primary telco they were using uh, had in place. They, they were not thinking about optimizing VNF on how it should work, but how the telco is running their OpenStack cloud. So, so help them out, right? Like if you work with the VNF vendors, don't leave them behind, like give them a feedback, tell them what you need. Um, and you know, this is the, the, the last one is pretty, pretty standard across, uh, across the board. Don't allow the way we have always done it. So when you look at the storage aspect within the cloud, what we started realizing is once you get into, you start automating your basic functions. So automate your deployment every time. That way, when you get past the first site, you get to your second, your third, your 30th, your 100th site, you deploy it the same way. From an operations perspective, that's the only way that you can actually be able to support something because 30 or 100 snowflakes are impossible to support. But once you get past the automation piece, what you start realizing is that you need to go further than that. Because when you have an issue within the telephone company, within the, the operator environment, 95 or so percent of those issues are known issues with known fixes. Those need to be automated as well. But not just the execution of the fix, but also the pattern recognition of the fix. You need to be able to take all those metrics, alarms, logs, and even packet tracing. Because we use packet tracing on all, every user and all their traffic in terms of getting that call flow up. We keep that so when our care people see and have a problem with the user, user calls in, I'm having an issue with my phone, they can go back and say, well, your call was set up the right way or it wasn't set up the right way, and we can get that feedback back to the network teams. Well, all this information needs to come together, and we need to be able to correlate it, not only across the VNFs and the functions, but also vertically across the hardware and the network elements as well. And based upon the analytics associated with it, we can identify known patterns and then trigger the fixes associated with it. This is the orchestration piece, and once you start getting in the orchestrator and what's going on, this is the fundamental aspect of it. But when you start distributing it, this analytics needs to be in the field with the environment, and that requires storage, a decent amount of storage, because without the data, you can't do trend analysis, you can't do the statistics, and this is what's needed, storage. Yeah. So I'm not gonna go too deep into the storage. I know this is the, not the most uh, interesting uh, aspect for, for the telco folks, but if, if you think about it, it's actually, it is quite important. So, so I'm just putting together here this, this chart of three different aspects of how you can evaluate different type of storage, right? So from the cost perspective, you can use the local storage, which is free, right? So, so that's, that's advantage. Um, but there's also uh, the things that are typically deployed with the OpenStack, which is the, the SDS solutions like Ceph, or, or even traditional uh, centralized storages, things like NetApps and EMC, et cetera, right? They, they all cost money, but they, they come with a bunch of features that you might be interested in, and you might actually saving money in the long run by, by picking one, one or the other. Um, so some of the features that will get you with the either SDS or, or uh, uh, traditional storage is you know, unified delivery, so you can hook this, them up to all of the 
all type of backends you have. Uh, you can scale it out, you can add more, uh, you can speed them up by, by just adding more nodes into the SEP storage, right, or, or add more capacity. There's advantage of uh, running it in the link clones mode, so you, you're saving space, you're actually, uh, you can actually get more out of the, uh, the centralized or SDS storage. You know, and, and something like disaster recovery and management, you're not gonna get that with the local storage, obviously. Um, and from the performance perspective, you know, you can, you can use both, you can use local storage and then throw some maybe all flash uh, SAP storage and, and maybe some traditional storage for the, for the legacy type of uh, workloads. All right, so, so quickly the difference between the, the local storage and the SDS, uh, as, as I see it, you know, with, with the local storage, you, it's really hard to plan when are you gonna run out of the space. And also it's gonna perform, at least initially, it's gonna not perform as well as the, something like Ceph or, or centralized storage. So you have to, every time you deploy the, your VNF to the compute, it has to transfer the entire image from the, your controller or from your uh, glance, whatever you keep your glance service into each compute, right? And if you have a hundred computes, you know, just add up, it's gonna, it's gonna take a time and it's gonna take a lot of space on each of these computes. Where with the SDS centralized, you know, everything is one place. You're, you're using the pipe of the networking to get to the storage, but everything happens on the, on the SDS or centralized storage and it's, it's HA and you get all the features that you, that you need. Uh, and here's, here's uh, my last chart for the, for the storage. There's some pros and cons to either one. Uh, typically, the software-defined storage is, again, it's unified delivery, so you can use it for object, block, and, and file system. You can scale it out, so if you either need to add capacity or performance, you just throw more SEP nodes to the mix, right? Or, or you, you throw some uh, flash storage to the, to the mix. And in case of Ceph, it's really fast moving. It moves together with OpenStack, so you don't have to worry about Bringing, bringing the newest version of the OpenStack to your, to your, to your labs and your data center and, and think about your storage vendor not being certified or, or not working with the newest version of the, uh, of the OpenStack. The, the disadvantage is, you know, these, these are managed the same way as you manage OpenStack, so they require the Linux skills, right? And storage people not always fond about learning Linux, especially if you're in a siloed type of uh, environment. Uh, with the traditional storage, you kind of, you know, your storage teams already knows it. Uh, they, the management and monitoring is usually a little bit more mature, so you get a little bit out of it. But again, it's silent. It might not come together with OpenStack. So something to uh, consider. So the other big thing about an operator is network. We have big pipes, some of them are over the air, some of them are back home to the data centers. But it's amazing how fast those pipes fill up. Terabits can go away just like that when you start talking users and multi-MIMO, multi-antenna, and all these folks pulling video at the same time. But when you look at the traffic, what you're seeing is, is that over 90% of the traffic is just the EPC bear path itself, the actual person on the phone moving data across LTE. The session border control, which is your primary interface into your Volte environment, your IMS environment, is where your voice traffic goes through. That piece is, is your next 5%, and then everything else fits into the last 5%. Well, the, the problem is, is that bottom 95%, the SBC and the EPC, need to have actual line rate traffic going across the node. Because getting a, a 100,000 processor course is pretty easy when you start talking about serving New York City with 20 million people, or heaven forbid, some of the um, East Asia cities that are 50 million people. All these folks moving voice and video calls at the same time just eats up your traffic. So being able to have efficiency, high speed, that SROV, that DPDK moving, if you've got a 10 gig interface or a 25 gig interface or a 100 gig interface into the node, you want to use all of it because fewer nodes means a lighter footprint, less power, more efficiency, less cost. But with that, you gotta, there's more to it than that because you have multiple data centers and these functions have to move around. Again, in order to get a 911 call across Volte, that requires both the EPC and those SBCs to be up all the time and be able to move around. We don't want grandma's 911 emergency call to fail. 
So with the network architecture, as uh, Chris mentioned earlier, um, talking to the telcos, uh, they're mostly using uh, OVS, and they're considering third-party SDN solutions, but of course, uh, that costs money. Um, the reasons why they're looking at those uh, third-party SDN solutions are for items such as stretching uh, L2, L3 uh, between OpenStack pods. Um, I use the term OpenStack pod here uh, to steal it from the container world, and it's a separate uh, installation of OpenStack uh, onto itself. So you have uh, OpenStack in uh, various geo locations. Um, then they, uh, also, uh, they want to also be able to do uh, integration with the service provider networks, uh, talking uh, MPLS versus uh, just doing straight L3 from uh, pod to pod. Uh, they want to do service function chaining um, to be able to uh, optimize that traffic and keep it, uh, keep it at a single layer rather than tra tra uh, traversing back and uh, up and down the layers of the, uh, the stack. Um, they want to have federated overlay networks from their pods so that they can have uh, systems in one location speak directly to the systems in the other location uh, effectively uh, to Aaron's point that you can't just keep things up in one location. So they look at stuff like SROV to reach that line speed, but the problem, SROV has some drawbacks. Uh, you, can't do, you can't do live migrations with SROV. Uh, so to, to, to ensure that you don't, uh, ensure that call doesn't go down, uh, you need to balance whether uh, the pros and cons of SROV uh, are beneficial for you to implement or not. You can look at, you know, we're in cases where SROV um, is not an optimal solution, you can look at DPDK. Um, in fact, uh, the, so the data plane um, development kit uh, allows you to skip that uh, kernel addressing between the uh, actual NIC card and the user space to optimize the throughput. Um, there's actually, uh, if you look online, there's uh, AT&T is working on um, a VNF daemon um, and, uh, that allows you to use DPDK to actually manipulate your SROV uh, underlying connect connections. Um, it's an open source project, so definitely check that out. Um, they want to be able to do workflow management within the data center um, and make things less complex for the, uh, for the networking. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why they're um, looking for the SDN solution to push that MPLS as close as they can to the, to the uh, in, uh, instances that they're doing. And lastly, they want to be able to do some traffic shaping in order to optimize uh, 911 calls over uh, someone's email. So here I listed a um, couple uh, pros and cons. Uh, SROV uh, gives you near line speed. Um, it, uh, so, because it's passing that uh, straight through to the uh, instance, allows you to do, um, do uh, VNFs to do uh, uh, NIC, uh, NIC sharing between your instances. Um, but as I mentioned, the cons comes with a loss of flexibility uh, for live migrations um, and loss of functionality. Uh, you basically are removing uh, any of the neutron firewall functions. That they basically have to be disabled for you to uh, leverage SROV. DPDK gives you, the tests have shown, gives you about 90% line speed. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's uh, all software based. Uh, you get the, although you get DPDK optimized NIC cards uh, for the best performance. And then um, the CPU overhead you need to consider with DPDK. Uh, so typically you'll allocate, uh, so you'll do some CPU pinning for your uh, DPDK application because that will pin the CPU at 100% uh, due to the, um, the polling driver that's uh, leveraged. Uh, the, the reason why they do that is that uh, they want to bypass the interrupts that are in the system because uh, interrupts cost overhead and, and delay your speed. Um, there's complex tuning uh, because DPDK is essentially a framework unto itself. It allows you to develop applications that uh, allow you to bypass that kernel space and uh, directly communicate to your NICs. Um, but like I said before, this is not a either or uh, situation, you can implement both or one or the other. Um, and uh, as I said, with at and is doing exactly that with, the, um, with their daemon that they've developed. So this here is um, what the, the general architecture is that uh, most of our telcos have when they're evaluating OVS. So they have specific uh, pods uh, in different geolocations, um, but what happens is they're running VXLAN out to uh, the provider network and then it hits the edge router where it then becomes MPLS to get passed all the way over to the other pod. Uh, there's a cost associated with that um, 
but the, with the caching and stuff, that's, uh, that's come down a lot uh, in regards to uh, performance. Uh, but one of, the, one of the problems is that you, can't, you have to have uh, separate uh, L3 networks between the two. You can't have a, a shared L3 network between your, your pods because uh, it's using the L3 network in order to pass that, pack, pass that traffic back and forth. So that's why they're considering these uh, uh, third-party SDN solutions that allow them to uh, push MPLS up to the instances. So um, since MPLS uses a labeling system, uh, they can actually have the same L3 in two locations and pass that traffic from one side to the other. It gives them that, it gives them that ability to do um, the uh, NFVs that they, that they want, run them in multiple uh, geos, and be able to ensure that they have um, maximum uptime. So this is a this is a breakdown of the uh, the vanilla uh, OVS um, at the uh, at the pod level. So when you look at this diagram, it's kind of an eye chart. You probably want to download it later and take a look at it. Um, so when you're talking about your virtual instances here, uh, the traffic has to come out uh, over the overlay network, get translated to the underlay network into the into the edge router, then it, then it has to get the label associated to it to send it to the other pod. Um, so uh, it's included in part of OpenStack, as you all know, so that's why they're looking at it, because it's cheap, it's easy to implement and, um, and run with it. The, uh, the provider networks, um, they, so they'll install provider, they'll run provider networks on their compute nodes uh, in order to take uh, the controller out of the data path for maximum performance. Um, and then uh, it has, uh, it, it's decreased complexity in the fact that you're talking IP to IP, and it's just tra it's just getting it's traversing the MPLS of your um, of your uh, provider uh, your provider network at the edge router, um, but like I said, the, uh, the it adds increased workload in order to do next pack next hop to next hop uh, traversing uh, within your data center to get out. Um, like uh, isolates L three, uh, and then it's kind of difficult to uh, manage within your own data center. Um, the networking team uh, wants to push, wants to ease, make things a lot easier by pushing this as far as they can all the way up the stack, uh, because then they don't have to worry about all of the stuff, all of the L3 routing and stuff within their within their data center. So, when looking at a third-party SDN, um, Juniper Contrails is a, uh, Open Contrails is one of the uh, more common ones we've we've seen out there. Um, they basically what they wind up doing is they replace your uh, OVS with a V router. So now you have routing capabilities out on your compute nodes, um, and then they push the, and then they do actually do the MPLS labeling at the compute node level, so that it can travel, it can travel from one pod to the other without uh, needing to uh, travel down the L three uh, stack and doing uh, next hop um, metrics. Um, it also the other advantages is that by pushing the MPLS up to the compute node, it within the core data center. It actually uh, reduces the um, reduces the amount of work that each of the routers within your data center actually have to use. Um, and then uh, at the SDN solutions, each SDN solution has uh, um, their own advantages in regards to um, being able to manage the capacity, do flow, uh, do traffic shaping, and stuff like that. So um, these are probably the uh, top. Uh, top three that the that we've seen the telco industry uh, interested in here. Um, when you're considering your SDN uh, vendors, uh, you need to consider uh, how they're architecturally deployed. Um, the monolithic versus the ML2 plugin. Uh, some some uh, some of the SDN solutions uh, based are basically are third-party communications for Neutron to talk to, rather than replacing some of the uh, parts replacing, uh, integrating with Neutron using an ML2. Um, the architecture, uh, self-sufficient pods, so you can, depending on um, how much money you can spend, you can uh, deploy SDN solutions which have uh, full controller control planes on each pod, and then they can all interact with each other. But some of SDN solutions require more of a, uh, an isolated location, uh, the centralized location uh, that all the pods can communicate to. And then the different licensing models uh, is something that also needs to be uh, taken into consideration when you're looking at the various third-party uh, SDN vendors. 
Um, so that's all we have for our session uh, here. Um, there's a couple sessions here, breakout sessions for uh, Red, that Red Hatter is doing at OpenStack Sydney. Um, I'll just go through them. But uh, I guess we can open it up for questions. Anyone still awake? If you don't have a question, you can share the telco story. Question. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I'd have to look at the study. Um, I took that from uh, from one of the stu the studies that uh, was done in order to test the line speed. Uh, I can, uh, if you want to come up afterwards, give me a card. I can send you the link to it. Oh, thank you. Okay. Yeah, well, so our slides are based on what we've talked to the uh, customers on, so that's uh, not something that they're, they're, they're really looking at right now. Thank you very much for attending. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.